round table event on Navalny and the recent protests in Russia. I am Fabien Bosseutz. Um, as you can see, there are two Fabien Bosseutz uh, in this webinar, but let's say that I'm the real Fabien Bosseutz. The other one is uh, our guest speaker. <laughs> but uh, hopefully, this will not uh, cause too much confusion. So, um, I will be moderating the event on behalf of the Russia platform of Ghent University. Now, before we continue, let me provide you with some technical information and instructions. As attendees of this event, you will not be able to turn on your microphone and camera during the event. If you want to ask questions to the speakers, then you can use the chat to do that. People who are following via the live stream, uh, maybe you can use the chat on the YouTube channel uh, if you have any questions. Um, and I think also those questions might be able to reach us. The questions will be collected by a colleague who will then send them to me. And the final 30 minutes of the event are reserved for answering the questions that you may have. You don't need to wait till then to put questions in the chat. So please feel free to post your questions throughout the discussion. OK, now let's return to the topic of the event. So this evening, together with our four speakers, we will be discussing the person of and the movement around Alexei Navalny. We will also assess to what extent the recent protests are a reflection of a wider societal discontent in Russia, rather than perhaps just direct support for Navalny. And in assessing these questions, we will also ask whether it makes sense to draw parallels with the ongoing protests in Belarus against President Lukashenko. Also, the implications for Russia's political future will be discussed, along with the substantial role played by the media, including also digital and social media. And last but not least, we will also address the question, what the EU should do? As Russia's relations with the European Union have further deteriorated over the poisoning, arrest and conviction of Navalny, the question remains what the EU could or should do. To discuss these questions, we have four prominent speakers who will share with us their expert views on these issues. Their expertise is very complementary in the sense that they are each experts on specific questions relating to today's discussion. We were very keen to give a platform to different views on these issues, and therefore we made sure to invite not only speakers from Belgium or Western Europe, but also speakers from Eastern Europe and from Russia. As Western Europeans, we tend to have a very specific view of Russia and of Russian politics, which is, of course, strongly influenced by our Western European views on democracy and politics. So therefore, we believe it's always interesting to be able to listen to the viewpoints of experts who have a more intimate understanding of the local context in Russia. So let me proudly present our four speakers. First of all, we have Professor Dmitry Goncharov. Professor Dmitry Goncharov works at the Political Science and International Affairs Department at the Higher School of Economics in St. Petersburg. So he's now with us live from St. Petersburg. He's also the director of the Political Science Master Program there. He teaches courses on Russian politics, comparative politics, both, um, political theory, political participation, and his research interests include Russian politics, democratic theories, and theories of democratization amongst others. Then next, we have uh, Nina Bashkatov, who you now see also <laughs> as Fabian Bosseit. Um, but so Nina Bashkatov has combined an academic career with journalism. In her capacity as Belgian news correspondent in Moscow, she followed on the spot the tectonic waves that shook the former Soviet Union and Russia. And she's been doing this since uh, 1986. In parallel, she went back to academia and she obtained a PhD based on a dissertation on the energy diplomacy of the Russian Federation, which later also turned into a book. She has been lecturing at different universities and she's currently associate member of the Center for International Relations Studies at University of Liège. Her latest book, which was published two years ago, is entitled Putin, l'homme que l'Occident aime haïr, or in English, Putin, the man that the West likes to hate. Then we also have Alexei Kazarsky. Dr. Kazarsky received his PhD from Comenius University in Bratislava in Slovakia. Uh, he now works there also as a lecturer 
and his PhD dissertation was published as a monograph in 2019 and is entitled Eurasian Integration and the Russian World, Regionism as an Identity Enterprise. Dr. Kazarsky has been a visiting researcher at several universities, including the University of Vienna. Uh, he previously also worked as a researcher and lecturer at Charles University in Prague. His main interest uh, in terms of research have been Central and Eastern Europe, but also Russia, uh, further also regionalism and regional integration. Then last but not least, we have Rashid Gabdulhakov. He's a PhD candidate and lecturer in the Department of Media and Communication at Erasmus University in Rotterdam in the Netherlands. His research focuses on digital vigilant, vigilantism, meaning citizen-led justice manifested online, he also works on surveillance and social media affordances. He has recently co-edited the book uh, entitled Vigilant Audiences. Now, without further ado, let's start the discussion. This, the discussion is structured along four sets of questions. Uh, the first set of questions focuses on the person of Navalny and the protest movement around him, as well as on the implications for Russia, Russia's political future. Let's start off by focusing on the key subject of our discussion, who is Alexei Navalny? Now, Dr. Bashkatov, um, can you tell us what is the movement around Alexei Navalny? Now, who are his supporters? Are they a uniform group or are they rather a diverse group? Um, also, has his support base changed over time? Because, of course, he's been active uh, for quite some time now. Have you seen any change in his support base? I give you the floor. You're still unmuted. You'll have to unmute yourself. Um. Okay, Hola. great, great, <laughs> perfect, go ahead. So I was saying that the, the basic answer is that Navalny changed in the country, changed a lot. And of course the supporters changed because it's all going together. And I think that uh, in the evolution of Navalny, I will point the fact that uh, he saw, I think with a, an acute political sense uh, that the old liberal opposition was not a tool to change the regime and more importantly, because he's terribly ambitious, what is absolutely normal for a political figure, that he can never uh, get out of this world where people were embittered in big ego discussion, who would be the leader, who would not be the leader. And in the same time, I think that he make uh, the right assumption that as I say first, he has to get out of that and make a name for himself uh, that he had to enlarge support geographically and uh, socially, what is what he has been done, that's what I'm talking of, changed, uh, that he has to find a way to keep the liberal opposition with him because it was his image of being a liberal and a different man of um, new figures and so on, but he needed them to, he cannot be rejected by them. But in the same time, he had to find a way not to be trapped by them. And that's why we will come to some of the points in the debate later on. And uh, I think he has also uh, the uh, assumption, the real one, that with the world today of communication, that we will talk a lot with Mr. Gabdurkov, um, he has to be seen as a figure in the West, too, because after all, the other countries, uh, they don't care much about who is the president of Russia is something from the West. And uh, so that's why I have the feeling that his evolution and the evolution of his supporter is a purely political calculation and the well uh, use of a changing situation around. Let's see. Thanks. So um, if I might continue <laughs> along that question. So what views does he then actually represent? So we know that in challenging President Putin, he focuses mainly on anti-corruption. 
in fact, he has been described as a nationalist, even as a racist. Um, he's also been criticized for supporting the annexation of Crimea, although he seems to represent a middle ground in that regard, because actually he demands a second real referendum to take place in Crimea. He's also considered to be rather, well, racist towards migrants coming from the South Caucasus and Central Asia. But we do know also that these comments date back from 10 years ago. Uh, and in a recent article in the New Yorker, a commentator has described how his views have been evolving and has, have been changing over time. Um, so how do you look at that? So, so, so what are really the views that he represents at this moment, let's say? Uh, there are different points in the question, in, in the question, so I will answer differently. I think that the anti-corruption uh, platform, uh, it's something that I am personally, as, and as a political scientist, I'm very suspicious of the sustainability uh, because it's a good way to mobilize people. But we have seen through so-called street revolutions in the Middle East, in Latin America, everywhere, that uh, the the uh, how do you call a border between anti-corruption move and populism, as we call it today, without giving a proper definition, but still, uh, it's very narrow. And uh, I always think that um, you cannot build, especially in a country like Russia, where you are lacking basis, you cannot build a purely platform for political movements and parties based only on, not only on corruption, because all the Russians know that they are living in a corrupted country, like many people in the West too. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's based, in fact, it's uh, when the, the, the goal is to build uh, a new society, uh, trust with the authorities, trust with the institution, in fact, is just doing the opposite because it's justified the, uh, the people rejection of institutions saying they are all rotten and so on. And it's encouraging what are not the best instincts of a population is to look around, to make gossips turning real things, uh, to look at, at the plate of your neighbors to see if he doesn't have a piece of meat that you don't have. So I think it's, I am highly suspicious of that, but I, as I see it can be discussed. Concern Crimea, uh, as you say, I mean, uh, supporting Crimea return to Russia, as it was called at the time, was largely partage if, even in the intellectual milieu and so on. It was really look, uh, seen as a historical revenge, the repairing of a mistake. So he was not very original in supporting. And I was myself, because I was at Moscow at the time, absolutely taken aback by the kind of uh, euphoria, I would say even uh, uh, unpleasant euphoria because it was too much about uh, Crimea. And I always thought that there was a link between this kind of euphoria, we can do everything, Russia is there and so on, and uh, the clumsy uh, intervention in Eastern Ukraine. So now going back to what you say about the accusation against Navalny. Um, I mean, again, uh, I think there is a tendency today to go in your past and pick up some sentences that you pronounce, even if they were not very recommendable. Uh, so that's a, a kind of a, a path with no use and abuse, uh, because now you are people who have, a, you know, coming back with something they made when they were teenagers. I mean, there is something unhealthy in that. So um, does it mean he's racist? I mean, it means that he's, I think a terrible opportunist and it's more dangerous uh, because it means that he seems that he's ready to defend uh, even unpleasant uh, and use unpleasant slogans if he believes that it's gaining support. What he did at the time, because at the time, uh, remember that the, the Russians were uh, feeling invaded as they say by foreigners. So it was meaning Central Asia and Caucasus, what they mean by invasion, it was that they were taken over an entire block of flats 
uh, sending their children at school in the quartier where uh, the people feel that they were downgrading the level. You know, the usual kind of when you have people invading, I would say, more your privacy than your country. And so he thought at the time, because as I say, he had to move from the liberal support to something else, the wave was there. Uh, he can surf on this kind of feeling, and he did. And remember that he made even something more foolish, foolish because uh, he was there encouraging the population, the, the demonstrators who were gathered at the Manege Square by telling, let's go and take power, you know, like if he wanted to assault the Kremlin. On the other way, you mentioned Gesson, I was reading Evgeny Albars too, uh, who are inventing incredibly tortuous explanation where he was not a racist, but he was using what was the meaning, et cetera, et cetera. I think that's shocking from people who pass from liberal analysts, uh, because then they enter also in his game that I'm grabbing everything around that can be useful for my career. So I think I talked enough about that. Sorry, I was muted. So, um, well, thank you very much. But maybe we can now pass the floor to Professor Goncharov. Um, because another question um, in this regard is, is whether Russia, well, imagine, huh? so let's imagine that Navalny would uh, be elected president. Would Russia really be following a different path um, with Navalny as, as president? Um, well, uh, it's a good question, uh, uh, and it's it's about uh, the future. And uh, political science is uh, not especially good in in uh, uh, the predicting uh, the future. But uh, definitely, well, uh, in in my uh, like, it, we are talking about uh, uh, how we can uh, see the uh, my, what kind of mindset uh, Navalny uh, is uh, having now and what kind of uh, um, uh, political project he can uh, shape based on uh, what um, he is now and uh, based on what uh, uh, he is doing now. And um, actually, I have a quite a, uh, well, despite all these uh, past uh, uh, um, happenings and uh, events uh, he was involved in, I have quite, uh, you know, kind of positive uh, um, view of his uh, current um, political um, position. And uh, um, he's, uh, quite uh, uh, successful in uh, building uh, <clears throat> um, um, a, a network uh, of uh, activists that can be quite potentially quite uh, useful in uh, uh, mobilizing um, liberal and pro-democratic uh, liberal uh, segment of, of the Russian society. So uh, uh, definitely, uh, talking uh, from uh, what we are uh, witnessing uh, um, right now, we can uh, expect uh, quite a positive uh, um, change in, uh, in Russian politics, uh, in the uh, like quite kind of normal democratic and, and liberal uh, uh, direction. Um, so, that is my, mm -hmm, but okay. of course it's kind of su su subjective. Uh, yes, um, but also, I mean, I know it's a very difficult question to answer. Uh, if you knew the answer to that question, uh, I think you would become a very important influential man. But um, if, if we go back to the recent protests, um, so how do you think they compare or differ to previous ones? And then I'm talking also about both political protests that have taken place in the past, but also more societal ones, such as the pension protests, the trucker protests. 
Um, if we go back in time a bit further to the uh, Balatnaya protests 10 years ago, what do you think is, is different this time or, or, or is it not that different? Well, it's different uh, in many ways. Uh, the, the, uh, the problem is uh, would uh, those uh, differences be like really important in terms of uh, producing a political change. But uh, 10 years ago, uh, the, uh, the wave of uh, protest was uh, um, provoked by uh, <clears throat> Uh, massive uh, um, electoral fraud, uh, which was uh, uh, recognized by uh, those who are uh, those kind of uh, members of uh, new middle class in, in major urban centers that uh, after years of being quite apolitical and passive uh, came to, to uh, um, uh, to vote, uh, um, to to um, uh, to uh, voting uh, polls, uh, and uh, um, so uh, ten years ago, uh, um, protests uh, started to um, uh, happening uh, after uh, the the elections, and uh, well, I mean parliamentary elections. It was of course. Uh, an important uh, part of the context uh, uh, where the preparations for presidential elections uh, um, were uh, happening. Uh, but um, to a very significant extent, uh, those who participated in a protest uh, 10 years ago, they uh, were um, quite uh, naive and they were not aware of uh, some basic structure of, of, of Russian politics. Now we are, um, uh, after all these years of uh, um, experience uh, uh, resulted from um, clearly authoritarian uh, trends in, in, uh, in, in Russian uh, politics, we have more uh, um, high level of uh, awareness, uh, public awareness about uh, the uh, authoritarian nature of uh, Russian politics, at least in in a particular segment of, uh, of Russian society. So, um, and uh, uh, protests protests started to uh, <clears throat> to happen um, month uh, before uh, the uh, elections. So, uh, this this time we have. Uh, a lot of uh, reasons to uh, uh, to foresee a uh, more um, politically uh, focused and more politically structured uh, 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 um, uh, wave of uh, protest, mm -hmm. well, uh, which actually, might be a part of uh, uh, a, pa a part of these electoral cycle. Exactly, and this is actually one of the the next questions I wanted to ask you. Um, so if we look at the, the potential of, of, of the recent protests um, and, and, well, let's say their sustainability in the next months, especially in light of the upcoming parliamentary elections. So then the question is, well, could the, the protests that, that took place re recently and, and let's say the, the broader public discontent, could, could they influence the upcoming Duma elections? Um, and if so, how? Well, definitely, do you think they they are already um, affecting uh, the, uh, the the nature of this particular electoral cycle. So actually, the, the electoral cycle uh, has begun uh, already, and uh, are um, it definitely. Uh, all these events and uh, I guess like a, a strategy uh, or um, of a mobilization which uh, um, still are to be uh, um, uh, revealed by uh, um, uh, people who are around Navalny in, in, in uh, FBK, uh, his uh, anti-corruption um, uh, foundation. Uh, definitely uh, the uh, the fact that um, 
protests so will be combined with uh, the um, a number of uh, um, uh, electoral strategies, uh, uh, which uh, was which were invented and suggested by Navalny and and his uh, um, uh, entourage, and all these will give uh, like a significant uh, strength to to uh, to this particular wave of um, uh, election uh, of protest. Okay, thank you. Okay, well, I would like to give the floor back to uh, Dr. Bashkatov. Well, so building on uh, further on, on, on this discussion, um, well, the so-called Crimean consensus that was there, so the, the, the political unity that we could see after the Crimean uh, annexation, well, this consensus seems to be eroding. Um, do you think that the current events or the recent events in Russia or perhaps a sign of, of weakening of the so-called Putinism in the country? Um, and then what does Navalny's arrest and, and also the use of force against the protesters tell us about the state um, of the Russian domestic politics? And also what does this tell us about the legitimacy of Putin's regime? Could this popular wave of discontent come as a serious challenge to his rule? It is certainly a challenge because uh, he's not used to that. The proof is the way the regime is reacting. I mean, it's a, it's a regime who never knew or even tried to learn how to open a dialogue with people who were different. And uh, that's what I, I found that uh, uh, that's the main problem of Russia is that you have a kind of stagnation at the top with a very low level of rotation of personal and so they they use uh, I mean even if they will be the most democrat and the well the most uh, interested in people but I doubt uh, but still they could not function in a society with moving especially in a Russian society who has been going to so much different events in in, uh, in 30 years so I think really the for me that's one of the most important problems and the uh, incapacity to dialogue is of course leading to using of force and repression because it's the only thing we left uh, to a, a power. Uh, does it mean that they are entirely losing grips and likes of people in the West are dreaming or hoping? I think it's to go a little far ahead. But there is a crispation, and I repeat, a feeling for years already that something has to move, people have to change in the end presidential administrations, for instance, or different ministry. But that being said, I, I join uh, Dmitry Goncharov by saying that uh, uh, it is interesting that all those movements are before election and not after election. So the problem now is to uh, make sure that uh, this movement uh, can translate in votes. Uh, because you can also detect uh, a danger or a weakness in having a movement who is saying, you know, everybody, as long as it's not Putin, is going to vote for, as long as it's not a deputy with a candidacy we supported by the uh, Kremlin is good too. I think it might backfire because uh, even among people who are supporting, even some who are demonstrating, when you discuss with people, they say, but I will not vote for Navalny. I might vote from some of his candidates if I have a sympathy. So I think that you will have a first a competition between the different parties, including uh, the so-called party of power to co-opt people, especially in the region because they are there some people who developed a profile uh, who are perceived by the people, not like those people distant in the Kremlin decided from Moscow and so on, but people who are ours. They know our problems, they acted, I don't know, to repair a road or a school and so on. And a lot of the regional movements and demonstrations were about regional and even local issues. So I repeat, it will depend how those people will be and can be co-opted by one or another party because it doesn't matter for voters, you know. And the second is by making these things uh, 
um, this kind of votes uh, for everywhere uh, against Putin. I mean, you have to read in Soviet time the vote against all, against all, who was a way, the only way to express your discontent. And it was kept for a time in Russia and then it was canceled. And so he's not inventing something new in a way, to say vote against Putin. But he can simply make the electoral campaign of other opponents of Putin. Uh, it can be the nationalists, even if they are not, they are in disarray for the moment, but they represent something. And the communists, of course, because I don't know if <coughs> some people who are more in contact than me with young people, but I'm astonished how among, for instance, young political scientists, you have not a nostalgia of the communist, but uh, a feeling that liberalism that it has been presented is not enough. And uh, so, uh, again, the communists are divided today, including about the support to Navalny, but they are there, they are a fault, they are well identified. Uh, it's not a link with the past, it's for me a projection in the future that you don't want to be uh, a copy of the liberal reforms of the uh, Yeltsin regime. So that's why I say it's, it's, it's fascinating because it, the strength who is there, the power who is there, the, the will who is there can go uh, in many directions. And Russia is a country where things change very quickly. And that's why people forget about Crimea because they have other problems. And uh, in two years, they can have forgot even uh, at the next presidential election. Okay, thank you very much. Well, let's perhaps now turn to the question of parallels with the anti-Lukashenko protests in Belarus that have been going on since the presidential elections there last summer. So, um, Dr. Kazarski, um, as someone who is from Belarus, um, you have been very closely following the events in your home country, of course. Could you then tell us what parallels, if any, um, could be drawn exactly between the recent events in, in uh, Russia and the protests that are still taking place in Belarus? Or do you think this is perhaps not a, a question that, that that's can or should be asked? Um, okay, thanks. Um, so thank you very much for inviting me. I'm very glad to be part of this uh, great panel. Um, I'll answer the question. I think it is worth answering, but <laughs> I will add one remark on Russia uh, to what Nina was saying that um, things um, change very quickly in Russia, but I think uh, they tend to not change for a very long time and then change very quickly. That's uh, the typical Russian pattern, I think. Um, as for Belarus, well, uh, I mean, of course you can draw some parallels. I think there are similarities, uh, but there are also important differences there. Uh, and one of them has to do with the scale uh, the scale of the protests, uh, because in Minsk, uh, we had literally hundreds of thousands of people. There are different estimations, but um, at the peak, there are uh, probably hundreds of thousands uh, in the streets. And also in Moscow, you, uh, January the 31st, I think you had something like uh, 150 or 200,000 people, uh, you know, estimations vary. But the thing is, Moscow is, what, five times bigger than Minsk. Um, so in proportion, this would have to be something like a million in Moscow um, or more. So I think um, the scale is not really comparable in this case, right? Uh, the Belarusian protests were uh, much more, much broader. Uh, they encompass a broader, um, broader parts of the segments of the society. And what is similar is um, I think that um, um, the kind of root cause uh, here is that the population is um, psychologically tired of uh, both regimes. But again, I think the extent is different. Right? And uh, part of this has to do with the fact that Russia is a much richer country. So it, uh, it's easier for uh, the uh, government to bribe the people. In, uh, in Belarus, um, things have not been looking very uh, exciting uh, from the economic point of view in the, in the recent years. So the government was, um, the regime was failing on its uh, so-called so social contract, right? So that is um, uh, when political freedoms are exchanged for some kind of economic stability and uh, very modest, I would say, growth. 
Um, another similarity, I think, is um, the kind of network nature uh, of the protests, because this has been um, a key feature of the protests in Belarus, this kind of horizontal solidarity, horizontal self-organization of uh, the protesters. And I think that something similar is also happening uh, in Russia. And, um, and that's where, of course, the social media play, uh, play a key role. Um, plus you have um, certain political figures that have been either um, isolated, they're put in prison or they're um, not, not, um, not in Belarus. Um, and of course, you cannot organize a revolution from prison. That's pretty difficult, even even today. Um, and in this sense, these uh, political figures um, serve as symbols rather than organizers of, of uh, the protests. And that's, I think, where we can draw another parallel. Okay. Well, if we then move on to look at the response. Um, of, of the Russian regime to the, the recent protests um, across Russia. Um, would you say that we see some, some changes there in how they would have responded previously? So do you think there may be, well, I'd say it's definitely not less, less repressive, but do you think that they have learned some lessons or drawn some lessons from uh, what was going on in, in, in Belarus um, since last summer in, in terms of how to response to, to such um, protest movements. Um, what is your view on that? Sorry, I muted myself. Well, there's no doubt that they're watching uh, this very closely, that the, the Kremlin is watching the events in Belarus very closely, right? So there is, um, uh, there is um, a number of phobias right, that uh, the Kremlin is known to have. Uh, but again, I mean, I think there are similarities and differences because uh, in Russia, it is true that there was unusually an unusually brutal crackdown right? um, uh, and unusual for Russia, not, not for Belarus. And some people are they're saying that this kind of reminds them of, 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 of Belarus, of Minsk, that this is in Minsk and Moscow, as they, as they call it. Uh, but again, I think the level of violence um, is different. I mean, uh, Belarus went through a, a real hell in, in August, and uh, I mean this uh, um, terrifying figure that uh, in the UN Human Rights Office there are several hundreds, um, uh, several hundred complaints uh, about torture in, in custody. Right, um, that was, um, um, and that's not something we're seeing in Russia, um, and hopefully something we won't see in Russia, but. On the other hand, um, I think uh, the Russian regime is definitely learning uh, from uh, from Belarus, and I think the main lesson is uh, what you may call preemptive brutality, right? Um, so you had these uh, very worrying symptoms, like uh, some people are saying that uh, for the first time in Russia, electric shockers were used so massively, right? Also, an interesting detail I noticed is that they. Um, switched off uh, the uh, wireless internet in some, some places like cafes. And uh, and this is, of course, very reminiscent of, of Belarus, where every Sunday you would have uh, all internet switched off, uh, including the mobile uh, mobile internet, so that uh, the protesters could not coordinate um, via social networks. So I think there's uh, quite a bit of learning going on. And the main lesson is that you need to be very tough, right? You need to hit first. Uh, that is something that uh, that Moscow is learning from Minsk. Okay, well, a final question when it comes to possible parallels or, or uh, possible uh, contagion, uh, if, if we can call it like that. Um, how would you perceive the recent online documentary that was denouncing Lukashenko's wealth? Do, do you think this was inspired by the online documentary that, that Navalny released about Putin's secret palace. You know, has this Lukashenko documentary then had have a similar impact in Belarus? Like what was this then suddenly a hot topic? Um, can, can you tell us a bit about that? Uh, sure. Well, I mean, 
you would need to ask the authors of the movie if, if uh, they were inspired by <laughs> by Navalny, but probably yes, in some way. I mean, it was it was um, made with a similar uh, similar purpose, right, uh, of educating uh, the broader population on the abuses uh, of the uh, the government. Um, the impact. Well, I I was watching the movie when it was uh, being live streamed, and there were about hundred thousand, I think, people watching at the same time. Um, which again may seem like a small number for Russia, but, but, but Belarus has uh, uh, fewer than 10, 10 million people. And by now it's at 5.7, I checked today, uh, it's at 5.7 million views on YouTube. Uh, now, of course, you have people from outside of Belarus um, watching, that would include myself too. Uh, but on the other hand, you have more than one person usually watching that movie on, on, on a single device. Right, uh, laptop. So you can uh, you can get a certain idea of how uh, popular this became. And one of the, one of the signs that it did have at least some impact is, of course, that the regime had to react publicly. Uh, there was, uh, I mean, all sorts of propaganda uh, counter narratives against uh, the movie, but also Lukashenko himself had to react publicly, which he doesn't openly do usually, right? Uh, and he said something like, I did not learn anything new from that movie or something like that, which was strange and nobody quite understood what he meant by that, whether he's acknowledging that all that property is indeed uh, his or or what, whatever that meant, but, but he, uh, he had this strange comment. I think the key difference though uh, with Russia is that uh, in Russia, and correct me if I'm wrong, but, but I think that many people uh, always sort of realize that the powerful are also the rich, right? That uh, there are these oligarchs and that's kind of inevitable and they're so rich, um, you know, like in the Persian Knights. And and, and um, that was what made Russia uh, different from, uh, from Belarus in terms of perceptions. Uh, not the reality, but perceptions. Uh, perceptions of Belarus in Russia and perceptions of Belarus in Belarus. Uh, so Lukashenko always posed as this kind of people's president uh, that, yeah, he may be a dictator, but he's not like the Russian oligarchs. He's very modest. Uh, he doesn't steal from the people. Um, you know, once he even said that he doesn't have an apartment, he has no place to live in, you know, after his uh, presidential term is over, he's going to uh, have to look uh, for a place, for a place to stay. I mean, of, of course, the people who were always opposed to uh, Lukashenko, they didn't really take this seriously. That was, uh, you know, a, uh, just uh, um, uh, you know, uh, another uh, another um, uh, reason to uh, um, to turn on the sarcasm, but uh, but you have a lot of people now who were apolitical previously, and they were involved in in, in, in politics in, in 2020. Uh, they got involved, and 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 to them, the movie explains uh, in very simple language which sometimes also borders on uh, being vulgar, that, that this guy is no different from the Russian guys. Okay, maybe he has less money, but, but the principle is, is the same. So basically the movie calls him uh, a crook, quote unquote. And that, that's something that might've been borrowed from, uh, from Navalny because he had his famous slogan, uh, the party of crooks and thieves, the United Russia. Okay, well, speaking of digital media and, and the impact of digital media. Let us now turn to the question, what role media, including social and digital media, have been playing in the recent protests in Russia? And so for, for this, I now turn to our fourth speaker, um, Rashid Gabdul Hakov. Um, so everyone saw or heard about uh, the video by, by Navalny of, of Putin's billion dollar palace. Um, uh, everyone is also aware of Navalny's exposure to a poisoning attack. Now, how could we gauge the impact of this video um, and also the news um, of the poisoning uh, attack? Um, so, uh, well, the impact on the Russian population. So, so what is the impact um, of Navalny's YouTube videos beyond just mere clicks and, and views? Do you have an idea of this and, and how can this, this impact be, be, be gauged? Thank you, Fabian. Good evening, everyone. Great pleasure to be here and be part of this discussion. Well, I think a uh, couple of immediate reactions. Everyone, but not everyone, right? Because uh, evidently, and I will bring in some stats from uh, the other center on the domestic views in Russia. But of course, the second reaction is to 
having this discussion beyond likes and clicks and shares. But for me, these are important art artifacts, right? As a media scholar, this is exactly what I look at. And it was unprecedented popularity, 100 million views in the first 10 days that the video was out. Uh, that magnitude, of course, just shows uh, the significance of these counter narratives, of the narratives that embarrass the regime uh, expose it domestically, of course, but embarrass it internationally, because in my view, the movie was as much for the domestic audience in Russia as it was uh, for external viewers. Now, I just checked the video today, 115 million views, uh, so the momentum is going down, but nevertheless, it's quite a bit. 4.5 million likes versus uh, 218,000 dislikes. So that means that people, so that to me is also an indicator of the polarization in audiences and audience partisanship when it comes to media products, because obviously those who came to watch this media product, this, uh, uh, this video, they also invest time into, into making their position visible, that they like the video and that they want to comment. And having looked at the comments continuously every now and then I visit and check again, the comments are predominantly anti-regime at this point, which is also quite unusual because normally you would have a troll army come in and try to sway the discussion or at least uh, delude it a little bit with alternative messages. Whereas here it's constant and continuous um, flow of the specific discourse, specific narrative. Now, of course, that's also indicating of um, not only the polarization and the partisanship among the viewers, uh, but also the different platforms in which specific products are shown. Of course, in Russian, at this point, the television is 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 predominantly occupied by uh, pro-regime narrative, right? As uh, what uh, Vera Tolls and Yuri uh, Tepper called the agitainment, right? Taking the ideologically infected ideological content, adapting it to the local realities, and um, presenting it in an entertaining manner. It's uh, the political shows that are aired on primetime television across state channels, state-owned or uh, loyal programs and channels, they of course are pitching one discourse and we can go into the abyss of, of discussion here, but basically the imperial ambition, the conspiracies of uh, the West, the demonization of the West, of course, and it's based on uh, uh, the idea that the West is trying to put Russia back on, on its knees, but also the uh, cultural backlash points such as the West being promiscuous or lacking family values and so on and so forth. So here we see uh, that there is a particular uh, audience that, of course, has to be connected to the internet, has to be a bit uh, digitally savvy. But nevertheless, it was also about uh, displaying this to people beyond Russia. Now, when it comes to those viewers, it's also interesting because another group of people that I monitor are the Russophones across Europe who organize themselves into the social media groups, right? Russophones in the Netherlands, Russophones in Germany, Russophones in Europe more broadly. And there in these public domains, the idea of, uh, well, Navalny hasn't uh, appeared much, uh, neither did this video. It, it, it was completely ignored. So that's, that's quite amazing to me. Of course, there are editorial positions of uh, group admins, but to me, it's an interesting sign that this was completely uh, pretty much ignored. Now, when it comes to, uh, uh, to the audience and seeing who viewed it and how people responded, I just have to rely on the data from the Nevada Center, right? Uh, so evidently it's 26% um, of the adult population who has seen the film and 62% uh, did not hear about it at all, apparently. So that's quite impressive. That's inside Russia. Uh, of course, there are variations in younger generation, perhaps by virtue of being connected to the internet, but also probably because uh, uh, of other reasons like the disenchantment in the regime and the entertainment of the product. And of course, the role of Telegram is important here. So uh, when it comes to platforms, they certainly provide an alternative message here. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, what you have been describing so far also is it's like well there is already now uh, an, an intricate confrontation emerging between the narratives that are spread by by the traditional pro-regime media and the narratives that are spread by by the counter-regime digital media um could you elaborate a little bit more on this because 
I'm also wondering to what extent this confrontation between these two types of media um, is changing the face of politics in, in Russia. We can judge this uh, by several things. One is, of course, the reaction of the regime to uh, these products that are available to, on digital media, to digital media platforms, and to audiences. Uh, like I've already mentioned, quite a bit of efforts have been put into instilling control over narratives domestically. Uh, a bit, quite a bit has been and continues to be invested into doing the same on the international arena through, plat through traditional media platforms like uh, RT or Sputnik. Uh, that, of course, also, it's not as crystal clear as in uh, the digital domain is one type of information and traditional media is other type of information because traditional media penetrate digital media. So we have to be aware of that. And when it comes to the state investing funds and other resources into delivering their strategic narrative domestically or internationally, it's done in a very tailored manner, right? And people invest uh, money into doing it in a local language. It's tailored messages. So I wouldn't differentiate it just in those simple terms. Now, nevertheless, social media affordances, they enable alternative voices. And that is something that is uh, dangerous for the regime because it can, uh, it, it questions regime's uh, relevance, stability, uh, even um, its uh, capacities, right? And because of the accusations that uh, some of the other panelists have already uh, mentioned. So things are done to gain control of the platforms, of course, much like with the domestic traditional media broadcasters, efforts have been put into appropriating platforms. Like Contacti is one example, right? And then continues uh, catch uh, hide and seek with, with, with other platforms. And pressure is being put on the global giants and sometimes unsuccessful, but other times successful, right? For instance, that uh, uh, case when Instagram complied with removing content that exposed Prihotka and Deripaska on a yacht uh, on the shores of Norway, Instagram complied and removed this content. So we already see a bit of compliance. Uh, there was a whole uh, brouhaha, of course, was trying to block Telegram while even the MFA continued to use Telegram, right? And recently the slowing down of uh, Twitter. So the regime is playing with platforms, seeing what mechanisms of pressure can be applied. At the same time, of course, pressure is seen to apply it on users and has been applied. That means that there is concern in what type of information people are exposed to. Since 2014, a wave of amendments to criminal co uh, code articles, right? Uh, 282, 280, uh, 354, 148, and even and people getting uh, imprisoned for extremism, uh, propagating fascism, spreading inter-ethnic and inter-religious hatred for likes and shares on uh, social media. Of course, some cases might, I, I did a study on this as well, some cases might have been genuine, genuine accusation and xenophobia. Of course, the question is, so should someone go to jail for, for that much time for that, right? Or, or be fined millions of rubles for that. And even though this uh, kind of harsh application of law, which was also quite selective, the law was unpredictable. So sometimes it was genuine, other times it was just random. Anyone could be arrested for virtually anything that leads to people thinking twice before they post certain uh, comment or share something or even click like. That is of course designed to instill a bit of self-censorship here. And even though it has been decriminalized a little bit, it doesn't change the nature of these fears, right? Because you can still get conditional uh, charges and you are still fined quite a bit. And if you repeat the offense, the fines only increase. So there is an attempt to build this kind of Chinese style firewall, but because it's too late in the process to do this technologically, and there are not that many resources at this point, alternative ways are being sought. One of them is the application of crazy law, bizarre law. It's really bizarre. It's selectively applied and anyone can be arrested for anything. If there is a person who needs to be arrested with the current conditions, any activity online can be tied to this law. Okay. Okay. Well, thanks. This is uh, extremely insightful. Um, so
But um, if we now, for, for, for now, leave aside um, the discussion on, on the role of the digital media versus the traditional media and so on, um, we will come back to that uh, in the Q&A because I've seen already some questions about it. Um, but let's now focus um, on our first, on our, sorry, on our fourth set uh, of questions, uh, also the final set of questions that we will discuss um, uh, at this round before we open the Q&A. Uh, that is, yeah, what, what could or should the EU do uh, when it comes to the, the, the recent protests that have been taken place? Um, Dr. Boshkatov, I would like to come back to you for this question first. Um, now, we, we all know that EU-Russia relations uh, remain at an all-time low. Uh, recently, they, they, they basically further dropped. Um, and this was of course, uh, because of, 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 of the, the poisoning, uh, the, the arrest and, and, and the conviction of Navalny. Um, now, what did the EU do in response? Well, the EU then imposed further sanctions. Um, do you think that this will have, a, have an impact? Uh, I mean, a further deterioration of the EU-Russia relationship? Um, or do you think, well, the relationship is already so bad that at this stage, um, imposing sanctions will not necessarily uh, affect the, this relationship? Well, you know, the EU, they need to make some gestures. They like that. And uh, to say that something can deteriorate is very difficult to see how, because we have been going from bad to worse. And somehow, somewhere, uh, there is no definitive breakup because nobody needs it and wants it and will do it. Uh, you know, it's for years that I'm starting lectures about the EU-Russia relation by saying, as last year, I can tell you that we start with the terrible uh, relations and it's going on and on and on. And I think you have to go back to the basis of the problem. And I would say there are two main. One is that, no, the, the global one is that no partners never knew what to do with the other. They knew they had to do something, that they were sharing the same continent, uh, that they have somewhere some interest in keeping this continent not too poor and not too unstable. That was it. So on the methods, there has never been further discussions. And then from the Russian side, you had, I think, a kind of um, looking down at EU, uh, not in the beginning, because in the beginning, it's always like that in Russia. They were all besotted with Russia and European values and so on and so on. Uh, and then, of course, they are faced with reality and the part of a lack of knowledge also at the time when it's deteriorated about what were the functioning of the EU. Because many things that they were accusing the Europeans were in fact linked to the fact that they didn't read the treaties. Of course, they are not the only one, uh, but uh, that they didn't have a deep knowledge about the complexity of uh, the European Union. So they tended to say, oh, you know, it's bad will. Uh, in fact, they don't want to have relations. They don't want to consider as uh, equal partners uh, and, and so on and so on. And uh, then the there is also the basic difference that Russia has national interests like the US and that EU don't. Uh, so they invented this thing that now they are uh, different of the others because of the values, but uh, I'm sorry to look a little cynical, but when you are confronted with real problems or real risk of deterioration up to a certain point, I mean, values are something that you accommodate it and it's very easy because it's not written black and white. You know, you can say human rights and so and so. Uh, and in which order do you serve them? You see, there is a lot of uh, misperception who has been there uh, on the basis. And now you have also to put in the picture that uh, Russia has very often been used when there were uh, division and that nobody wanted to take a lead in something too strong. And then there was this uh, slogans, let not put in divided us. I mean, everybody heard that for a thousand times. In fact, it was uh, hiding a kind of impotence and a uh, also the fact that bilateral relations were continuing despite the EU level decision. 
And that Russia, of course, had all interest to deal at bilateral level because it's more efficient. If only you forget all the attempt to divide the EU and so on. I mean, EU is divided without the need of Russia. And then you have the confusion is another element that I would ask at no, is the question of the US. I mean, the, the pressure of US on European decision making process is huge and it's not transparent. And that's uh, one of the things which is frustrating perhaps the Russians, but certainly the Europeans. And now you have this declaration, you know, you have this big hope, Trump is gone, and now we, we have a complete change. And then we had uh, to face again that America the first is under the Republicans and the Democrats, and that we have to cope because they can divide it for the interests of the United States. And then you have this declaration of Biden. I mean, what do you do with that? I'm sure that in all the diplomatic circles in EU level, they, they almost fell from their chairs uh, because it's almost uh, the kind of Trumpist kind of ex cathedra declaration without even thinking of what he's saying because he's the president of the United States, who of course has been trapped at a very skilled interviewer with a specialist in foreign policy. But that's showing also a kind of dangerous amateurism, just that we don't have the tweets anymore. So we'll see how it will wait on the uh, European Council of next week when mm -hmm. they have to uh, examine the question of sanctions. But I mean, EU is a very late convert to the use of sanctions for political uh, gains. Uh, mm -hmm. So they have also to endoctrine almost themselves to consider that more sanction would be a good political tool. And we don't have the American way of using sanction more and more uh, for uh, settling the economic rivalries through the world, including with EU. So that's the, um, the, the pattern. So I will see what well, they, they will uh, decide. Mm -hmm. Uh, probably some more sanctions, but not meaning much because, I mean, the idea of EU is to also, uh, you know, it's like to have your, your cup and the cup and the coffee and everything together with your decision. And uh, so the, the idea is that they want to make sanctions, who will sanction oligarchs who are close to Putin, who were making the regime surviving without touching the ordinary Russians, who will understand how they have an interest to vote for somebody else. Uh, I'm sorry, I, I have more and more difficulty to, to buy that. Okay, thank you. Well, maybe we, we can uh, turn back to um, Professor Goncharov. Maybe it would be also interesting to hear this from a Russian perspective, uh, not necessarily from, from your personal perspective, but more from a Russian perspective. So um, I know that you're not necessarily uh, an expert uh, um, on, on foreign policy, but, but nevertheless, it would be interesting to hear from you um, how, how Russia has been looking. Uh, well, first of all, of course, at um, the, the latest sanctions that the EU um, imposed uh, over the, the poisoning and the arrest and the conviction of Navalny. Um, but then also about the, the likelihood that there will be a new alliance again between European Union and the US. Um, how do Russians, well, in, in let's say the Russian regime, how does the Russian regime look at this? Is this for them really a threat? And, and do you think that uh, this could lead really to um, a detrimental rupture between the EU and Russia, if such an alliance between, um, well, a strong alliance between the EU and, and, and the US would take place? Um, yeah, I, I think that there are, it's a very important uh, uh, development uh, in uh, international, um, relations in, in uh, Russia West uh, uh, relations so it's uh, definitely um, I, I'm pretty sure that from the uh, Russian perspective from the perspective of uh, I, I've already seen some you know kind of signs that people from like Russian uh, 
international relations uh, academia they are some of them are kind of you know kind of um uh you know they serve as their interpreters of the official uh, positions of, of the russian government and i see that they are quite uh, uh, kind of concerned with these uh, uh, prospective um, alliance between uh, Europe and the uh, um, US, uh, like back in, in, in Trump years, uh, that was probably like one of the biggest uh, uh, disadvantages um, in the like uh, united Western uh, approach to to uh, to to, uh, to uh, Russian domestic um, political development. So, like uh, Russia did uh, benefit a lot uh, from uh, the fact that uh, Trump uh, was kind of anti-European uh, 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 American president and uh, tried to like um, to do everything uh, to to uh, build a quite. Um, high level of hostility between the uh, United States and, and Europe. Uh, and that was quite beneficial for, for, uh, for Russia. And uh, it, it, it did create a very comfortable uh, international context uh, for, uh, for Putin uh, um, and his aunt Russia here in Russia. So it's like, uh, I guess that the, well, sanctions is um, in general, it's a, it's a very tricky uh, uh, issue. So it's uh, it's uh, still not clear how uh, uh, they can um, uh, um, work to to uh, to produce some change in Russian politics. Uh, uh, but uh, the, um, the the general change in the structure of uh, international relations so with a uh, higher level of uh, um, common uh, understanding and common uh, activities uh, uh, on the side of uh, uh, Russia and European Union uh, uh, might be uh, a very um, uncomfortable uh, uh, development in the international context of uh, for, for Russian political uh, activity. Okay, thank you. Well, maybe as, as a final question then before we uh, move on and, and uh, start the Q&A. Um, Rashid, if I may <laughs> take the honor of asking the final question to you. Um, so following up, of course, still on, on, on um, what the EU should do or the possible consequences of a new alliance between the EU and the US in terms of yeah, the, 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 the relationship, the future relationship between the EU and Russia. So, so what about the expression, if you want peace, prepare for war? So do you think that maybe a battle is necessary in order to reestablish more constructive relations between the EU and Russia on a new basis? Um, or would you say, well, no, there are definitely other less confrontational alternatives that could lead to an improvement of the relationship between the EU and Russia? Okay, Fabian, let me react to this, but also through the media perspective, right? Because we have discussed, we opened the discussion, one of the questions concerned the future, and of course, prediction is, is quite a bit speculative, but what's known, what's comfortable for people is the past. So in the media, I also see quite a bit of return to the past familiar grounds as in who we define as enemies, who we define as allies, right? So that familiar ground of the Cold War era, that imperial ambition, the role of World War II, the continuous reminder that, hey, if you, if you dare teach us how to live, we will repeat barely in you know, style uh, and so on. So these ideas are penetrating the Russian media domain. Of course, the demonization of Russia is also something that is present across media in the West. Well, even the way uh, the, the West, right, friend, is it's like one homogeneous entity, but is it really? Look at the EU. There are uh, countries that are uh, Eurosceptic, and uh, you know, there is also the uh, rightist populist. Uh, lobby that are in awe with Putin and Putin's regime. So who is fighting whom is a good question, because when you have a war, you have two sides that you also have the, uh, uh, you know, 
counter forces and counter counter forces, so to speak. So to me, from the media perspective, the biggest danger that I see is, is in this demonization of each side, which of course is a product of that, that political conf confrontation, but it will echo on the ground at the grassroots level between the people and it already echoes. So I noticed this again, a, a bit of human uh, everyday perspective is important to bring into the discussion as well, right? I notice it in, among the students who come from Russia and who carry this weight on their shoulders, right? That weight of the political ambition of the political elites in their country to which they almost are asked to respond here by their peers and so on. Uh, but nevertheless, of course, while demonization is taking place on both sides, the EU has to stand up by its values and has to co confront the regime because with this regime, we, and while Putin is in power, there will be uh, no establishing any, any form of compromise, unfortunately. So for this, but uh, for, for, within this battle, it's, it's a matter of uh, waiting and hoping that something more uh, coherent will come after because the regime is built on demonization of the West and the reminder of those historical narratives of romanticizing war. On this lovely note, I will end, thanks. Okay, well, thanks. Um, well, I think um, it's, it's time now to uh, open the floor uh, for the questions from the audience. Um, so my colleagues have in the meantime gathered all the questions. Um, there have been quite a few questions raised um, and they touch upon uh, various issues, uh, um, of course, issues that have already been discussed. Um, so I think we can go back uh, more or less in, in, in the order of, of the set of questions um, that we followed uh, to structure the discussion. And so um, a first question uh, relates then to yeah, the support uh, base uh, of Navalny. Um, so one of the attendees was wondering whether there is any knowledge of, of the percentage of the Russian, Russian population that support Navalny? Do we, do we really know this? Um, I believe this, this is probably a difficult question. I'm not sure whether any studies have already shown um, the percentages, but maybe Nina, I don't know, do, do you have uh, a view on, on this? You are still muted. Yes, no? there you are. Okay. So I don't have access to things that nobody had before me and together with me. Uh, I think I would add more credibility to what is published to Le from Levada, uh, with probably the most generous that you can have, but also credible. And so he was going for three, four person to eight, nine, but uh, probably Dimitri will know more precise. Uh, okay, figures. so we, yes, we can ask uh, Dimitri. Um, so do, do you have a more accurate idea of this? Uh, uh, recent polls, uh, are they tell that it like uh, the approval of uh, Navalny is uh, somewhere like um, around 16 or 17 or percent. Um, so it's, uh, uh, but uh, the uh, public recognition of, uh, of him uh, uh, increased significantly uh, after the, um, this uh, um, video about or, um, uh, Putin's uh, palace and, uh, and actually like uh, now Navalny, he, he was banned, uh, his name, uh, well, you know, like Putin never, uh, you know, mentioned his, his name uh, in, uh, um, publicly uh, and Navalny, like even his name was like totally banned from the uh, Russian um, television, but recently um, a lot of um, propaganda, 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 propaganda materials uh, started to appear. Well, I, I, I saw nothing called that. I, I have no television uh, in, in my house, uh, but uh, it's, it, it's kind of a big deal. Uh, 
that uh, finally um, the television started uh, talking about Navalny. Well, of course, in, in an extremely negative way, but uh, still it uh, uh, helped uh, enormously to boost his uh, um, public recognition. Uh, mm. um, yes, well, actually, a follow-up question uh, that was also raised in the chat is uh, very much linked to this. So whether the time that he's now spending in prison, uh, whether that will add further credit to his popularity, but I guess based on what you're saying, yes, I guess the answer is yes. Presumably this will give a boost to his popularity even further. Well, but not like exactly popularity. So it's like, uh, it's kind of a difficult um, concept. Uh, uh, it's, but def definitely um, it, uh, it has led uh, already to the uh, significant uh, um, uh, um, increase uh, 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 in, in his uh, uh, public recognition and variance. So people like across the all um, social uh, uh, groups and like across all political identities in, mm -hmm. in, in Russia. This is another question. This is actually another question that was raised in the chat um, and, and which was specifically for you. Uh, the question is also what kinds of segment of the Russian society is now supporting Navalny and the protests? Uh, because yeah, they say that you were referring to this segment, so they would like to know wh which ones you mean. Uh, well, uh, when we talk about Navalny, it's probably it, it's not so important, like how many people um, like would support him exactly. Uh, well, because he's um, um, he's a very uh, important and influential uh, figure in Russian po politics. But it uh, does not necessarily mean that like uh, like uh, everyone would like uh, vote uh, for him uh, if he he runs for for um, uh, the president. Uh, of it. Yeah, another, this but, is not a question, <laughs> exactly yeah, but, like whether they would vote for him. <laughs> yeah, but he, he uh, and he, he uh, the movement uh, uh, which is behind him, um, like a rather structured uh, uh, movement, they suggested um, a very powerful uh, instrument to uh, to challenge the um, uh, political monopoly and uh, uh, um, domination of uh, uh, United Russia and, uh, and probably even Putin himself. So it's like uh, this smart uh, voting or umne Savania strategy, uh, um, which is uh, like very closely associated with uh, his name, uh, might uh, play a, a rather um, significant uh, role in the uh, 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 elections later uh, in the year, and also it might be um, a part of, of the context to, to boost the uh, uh, protest uh, um, um, wave, uh, which is I, I'm pretty sure is going to happen later in, in, in this year in, in summer, mm -hmm. because it's like uh, all these um, strategies which are um, and like actions which uh, um, uh, um, have to be uh, taken to uh, to implement uh, this strategy uh, might be also um, uh, used uh, as an instrument and and uh, strategies for political uh, uh, anti-regime political mobilization across uh, many uh, um, the political segments of, of, uh, of the Russian society. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, Nina, you have raised your hand. Uh, I, I assume you would like to um, add uh, some, some insights to what was already mentioned? You are still muted. I'm sorry. No problem. <laughs> well, I just wanted to add to what uh, Dimitri was saying. Uh, it means that it depends, and also your question, it depends what we are measuring. Because the figures, you can have figures, but they, the, the, the polls or the institute who made these uh, polls are measuring or the intention of vote with one thing, or uh, do you know the person of Navalny, which of course has been increasing uh, spectacularly 
because of the publication and even know that he's a target for critics. So it means that his name and his person is there. So after all, it's like the stars in Hollywood, the important is that people talk of you. But uh, be cautious not to mix uh, the intention of votes who are quite low, obviously. That's... Okay, thanks. Um, okay, so then um, another question uh, which relates to this discussion is, well, still, what about the idea that Navalny um, um, is not necessarily supported by the Russians, but that Russians do support uh, or sympathize with his anti-corruption ideas? Um, so how, how can we still um, look at this? Because this, still, um, this also goes back to, to, to an earlier question that we uh, raised during the discussion. So to what extent still do we see that, that people are protesting, not necessarily in support of Navalny, but, but rather in support of, of, of his broader idea, the anti-corruption idea, of course, but also the, the, the broader societal um, discontent that we, we, we currently witness in Russia? Um, so Nina, maybe you can also elaborate on, on this point? Yes, I think that uh, we have to go back a long time ago. I mean, almost as long as I have been working in Moscow, I knew protest against corruption. Uh, you have all the colored revolutions in 2004-05, were all based on protesting against corruption. And uh, somebody was mentioning, I remember, I think it's Rashid, about uh, the effect on uh, the, the population and the people who wanted to leave, like poor people and so on. Remember uh, Sakashvili who wanted to leave in the two bedrooms would be his office and uh, his uh, family house. And then, you know, he finished with also his own palace, but in Georgian style. Uh, you have that in Ukraine too. And I mean, the problem is that you think that uh, you tend to believe that all those countries have been unable to uh, equip themselves uh, with a system of uh, relations between the different circles of a society with without corruption. And I think that the difference is that in Soviet time and early Russian time, everybody can get something of corruption. It can be just on your small level that you are taking back home some soap for washing the dishes or a pair of shoes that you subtracted from the shops or something like that. And uh, today, I, I think for 10 years now, uh, ordinary people are suffering of corruption, uh, including in their ordinary life, but they were not during the 10 first days when the society was in boom and everybody had the feeling they can get rich and that's why they were silent including the middle class and then now you are in a system with more frozen uh, in a way like in our societies where the society is terribly polarized between those who profit of the system and those who don't and so no ordinary people have no way to benefit from corruption they are just uh, at the losing end. And that's why you can mobilize people, but you have to offer them more than simply fighting uh, corruption because it tends to be a model who repeat itself. And then the other thing too, is that this anti-corruption, the same things were appearing in different movements of uh, anti-regime. Uh, it can be not only in the former Soviet Union or Central Europe or North Africa, but they tend to replicate. So you have the feeling of a, a kind of pattern who has been designed once for all, where you come with a film about that and a film about that. I mean, remember the story of the Palace of Putin. I mean, it's in the public for 12th year. We had before the Medvedev Palace and we had a lot of things. And I repeat, it's part of a strategy probably to conquer power, but it's not a, a good way to uh, keep people to politics. That's it. <laughs> Okay, well, uh, there's still quite a few questions, so I, I should uh, probably move on. Uh, but another question that was raised uh, relates to the uh, pro Navalny Russians, uh, whoever they are, because I think they are quite a diverse group. But um, the question is whether these people are perhaps romanticizing the EU and the West. Now, I think 
this is not an easy question because because it's such a diverse group it probably really depends uh on what segment of society they represent uh but maybe dimitri you can uh try to answer this question to some extent so the question is whether pro Navalny Russians are uh, romanticizing the EU and the West. Um, well, probably to some extent, but uh, I, I do not believe that uh, this generation is uh, like too, you know, kind of, they, uh, they know how um, life uh, works uh, in, in Europe or so like, uh, especially those who live in Moscow, in St. Petersburg, they have, uh, most of them, or probably all of them, have a rather, well, kind of rich experience uh, visiting, uh, um, like, especially in St. Petersburg. So, like, Helsinki is, uh, is kind of a suburban uh, um, uh, area to, to some extent for, for, for St. Petersburg. We are closer to Helsinki now than to, to Moscow or in, in, in some uh, uh, in some way. So um, it, it used to be like back in in, um, in my days as, as a young uh, man. So when uh, in, in, in late Soviet Union, we, we did romanticize, we uh, did uh, idealize uh, uh, like uh, life uh, in, in the West. So we did know nothing uh, actually about uh, what uh, was going on uh, over there uh, in terms of some real uh, lifestyles and, and so on but now it's not about um, uh, i i think that people are um, this generation are, are, uh, and the the young people who are members of the uh, navalny's uh, movement they are rather m much more pragmatic and they are more um, concerned with the uh, uh, domestic political uh, uh, development in Russia, so they they know basic principles. And, well, some probably in some kind of idealized way, uh, basic principles of how liberal democracy uh, works or should uh, work. But still, I would not say that they have uh, uh, like to idealized or romanticized uh, view of uh, the uh, the west in, in general so it, it's it's quite quite different uh, uh, generation uh, more kind of you know cosmopolitic uh, cosmopolitical Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Uh, well, Alex, I would like to turn to you now because uh, there was also a question um, about well the idea that you know. Navalny is a creation of the West uh, uh, to construct an artificially uh, opposition. But um, we have already looked into this, but maybe you can uh, elaborate a little bit on this, but also from the perspective of, of what is going on in Belarus and to what extent we're also witnessing such um, attempts by the regime to um, demonize um, the, the opposition leaders um, and to also say that these are just uh, attempts by the West uh, to create an artificial opposition. Okay, well, that's a very in interesting construction of the West, which uh, says that Crimea is not a sandwich and that it cannot just be given back to Ukraine. I mean, uh, we've mentioned this, um, this fact that he's, um, I think, uh, in favor of a second referendum. I mean, pardon me, but... <laughs> That might look like very generous from the Russian perspective, but imagine that somebody comes in, into, into your country and tells you, okay, let's have a referendum on, uh, I don't know, part of Belgium or Holland uh, uh, joining uh, another country, right? Uh, so how would you react to that? Uh, so if that's, if he's a construction of the West, that's a very interesting construction. I haven't seen, uh, <laughs> um, I rarely see um, pro-Western politicians um, like that. Um, in general, I don't, I don't think it's, um, I'm not, I'm not sure how interesting this is in terms of commenting on propaganda because the narrative is very old. Uh, and, uh, I mean, some of these notions are very deep, deep seated, uh, you know, about the evil West and, 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 uh, and the heroic, uh, Russian civilization that, that, uh, uh opposes the West. 
Um, I think uh, in practical terms, we've, um, uh, if, if this was ever a question, uh, now we have an answer that uh, you cannot organize a revolution from the outside. Um, because if you could, it would have been done a long time ago, let's say in Belarus, but you cannot. You need some indigenous dynamics, uh, which will uh, at some point uh, be triggered into, into something um, like we saw in, in, in uh, Belarus in August and later on. So really, um, I mean, I, I don't know what to say. <laughs> this narrative is old and, and uh, I mean, arguing with it is kind of strange because... Uh, Oh, we, we, there is another question. Uh, there is another question for you, who, who well, which is slightly related um, to the previous question, namely whether, um, well, if we want to call it successful, uh, so the relatively successful crackdown um, on um, the, the, the recent Russian protests, whether this could weaken uh, or, or otherwise negatively influence the protests in Belarus in, in the near future. Whether the crackdown is uh, is going to um, have an impact. well, let's say let's say that the crackdown of, of the protests in in, in Russia um, was relatively successful. Um, so could this um, weaken the protest movement in in Belarus, uh, or could it negatively influence uh, the protest movement in the near future? I mean, I, I don't I don't see I don't see how. I mean, of course, it's not uh, it's not very inspiring. Uh, and uh, to begin with, uh, change in Russia would probably bring uh, change in Belarus as well. Uh, but like I already said earlier, uh, Belarus went through a special kind of hell uh, in, in August, which um, uh, fortunately did not come to Russia and hopefully will never come to Russia. Um, so it's uh, what, what happened in Russia, the crackdown uh, is a light version of what was going on in Belarus, let's put it this way. So I don't, I don't see, I don't see um, how it might have a major impact on Belarus. I think the indigenous dynamics are more important and we shouldn't overestimate, uh, you know, the influence of outside forces. Okay. Well, then there's also a question for Rashid. Um, so the question I think comes from someone who's definitely an academic because uh, it's written in a rather academic way. Uh, but the question is um, whether the recently imposed rules about online behavior undercut the idea of rule of law and increase the discretionary power of the regime. If so, how will this increased discretionary power affect political and economic incentives or behavior? Uh, I see it's a question from our previous director of the Russia platform, who is an economist. I see. Okay. Uh, Rashid, the floor is yours. It's a pleasure. I will answer this, but maybe with a, uh, again, with a media floor to it, right? Uh, it's, yeah. It's interesting to frame it in the in the domain of the rule of law. Yeah, certainly it is the rule of law, but it's a very different type of rule of law. Like I already mentioned, it's applied selectively. That means that the law is an instrument in the hands of uh, those who operationalize it. If we look at some of the narratives for which people receive sentences or fines, for instance, there are some untouchables, right, in terms of uh, themes. Uh, one untouchable is protest. If you tweet about protests, live protests, share, you will go to jail. Well, your chances increase, right? And if you do that on contact, your chances are even higher. Uh, if you touch the Orthodox Church, and if you touch the uh, Crimea-Ukraine uh, theme, and of course, if you criticize the elites. First, this was kind of uh, just happening as, as a systematic response, but now it's sealed in the law as well, right? Because of anti-fake news, the law countering disrespect towards the il political elites and so on. The way these laws are called is also quite fascinating, right? The freedom of speech law, amazing. The, or the, you know, the anti-fake news law. Some of them are actually even copied from the West. So we see like the, the uh, German uh, so-called Facebook law, right? That puts pressure on platforms to weed out fake news or disinformation is now successfully in, in implemented in Russia to uh, silence the dissenting voices. How will that play on the Russia's market? Well, I guess it's, we can talk about the, the digital tools that are available to people is of no interest to the regime. What is of interest is to silence the alternative 
voices that are certainly prominent. Uh, and we see that some of the affordances of digital media, like the channels on Telegram, they're especially bothering to the regime and they will be targeted predominantly. And I think one other point I want to make, we have touched upon who are these mysterious Navalny supporters. We cannot, while I'm certain we cannot portray one homogeneous group here, they are different. Some probably support him because they oppose Putin. Some support him because they're genuinely in support of Navalny. He is a politician. After all, politicians tend to have supporters. Uh, let's 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 say uh, there is another group that I want to bring into the discussion, and to frame them as group that doesn't support Putin. So Putin began sort of his reign with instrumentalization of youth. Yeah, the movement uh, walking together, Idushi Messi and uh, Nashi. Yeah, ours. The patriotic pro-regime groups that eventually were repackaged into vigilante groups like Stop Ham, Khrushchev Protest, and so on and so forth. Groups that uh, used as a facade idea for something happening at the societal level where youth activists are countering societal problems. Now, there is a disconnect at this point between the aging leader and the digitally savvy youth at this point. And the digitally savvy youth now is not like in 2005, 2008. To them, Putin is not an admirable leader. So new efforts will be put into exactly instrumentalizing them, whether by winning the minds and hearts, which at this point is problematic and virtually impossible, or by force, which the latter is more likely. Okay, wow, thanks. Uh, that's a strong language, I would say, but it does bring me to the next question uh, that I have here. Um, <laughs> I would say it's probably the, the million dollar question. It's not the million dollar palace, but the million uh, dollar question. Namely, whether in the current political situation in Russia and also the current political system um, that was created and consolidated uh, over the years under Putin, whether there is really a chance for an alternative and for a more democratic and, and, and fairer kind of governance. Nina, I think I will give this question to you, but if you want, uh, you can also pass it on to someone else, but I will first give the floor to you and you'll have to mute yourself. Okay, there you go. Um, yes, I do. Uh, I think we have to make a difference between another president and another practice and a total change. I think that you cannot expect to have somebody be elected in Russia uh, by being radically different and adopting a radical different position. I mean, Russia will stay Russia and the Russians, unless the Russians were there, uh, say the opposite, I would believe it, but I always had the feeling that they were asking about, uh, they had the same uh, expectation towards leaders and one of them being, you know, the great idea that Russia is a great country, that their people are under that their culture. I mean, for instance, the, to come back to Biden to say that Putin has no soul. I think that you have to be totally ignorant of what it's meaning in Russians to say that a person has no soul. And uh, so I think we will be wrong. What we can expect, it's for my money, uh, somebody, coming very quickly uh, out of the shadow of Putin, uh, who will be younger, with a different set of mind, um, with uh, some range of trust who will last at least, let's say, for a year or two. <laughs> and um, we would, yes, inspire confidence and giving the feeling that we can restart something. Because I think that in, in Russia, uh, people not necessarily dislike the person of Putin, but they dislike even not the regime, but what they are living in it. They are a little confused, of, of course, outside intellectual and academic circles where you can identify uh, more what you want. I think that they want to be treated like normal people and that when you are abroad to be Russian is not immediately being asked uh, questions about uh, people in jail and the gulag and so on and so on. But when there is a Russian film which projected abroad is not analyzed only in terms of signals against the regime and denunciations of the role of that or that. I mean, there, there is a need for normality and I think that Putin doesn't give this feeling anymore. And uh, on the Western side, uh, Western side, I think they would be also happy to have somebody who is not controversial, uh, 
uh, will not go over the top like you had with the transition in the 90s, but will in a way uh, give a green light for the West without discrediting himself, itself pardon, uh, to be able to regain some type of relations. And uh, that's why I have some expectation about the result of the parliamentary election, because it can be at least a sign of another rapport de force and that uh, systematically the parliament will not be used as a rubber stamp because it's dominated by people who owe everything to the power. So that's one, one thing. And the other, I think uh, from the West then, uh, no go over the top about what you want to do, what you can do, etc. And then see Putin's uh, fingers uh, beyond anything that is happening in the West. I mean, the American election, the Brexit, I mean, the COVID, soon we will learn. Uh, so there is something, a kind of normalization of minds in the West. And then to come back to something that Rashid was mentioning, uh, but the question, you know, if you want peace, uh, prepare for war. Well, I think that uh, EU is now in the temptation because they are so happy to get rid of Trump uh, to rebegin this kind of confusion between EU and NATO. Oh. And uh, if you go back to the relations between uh, the West and, and Russia, and especially the Europeans, uh, you see that one of the problem and the basis has been that the enlargements uh, we were after all coming to their borders was made by under more the influence of Washington than Brussels at a certain point, and that in some case, like, was very clear if you go back to the text published at the moment of attempt to enlarge to the Baltic states, that those people were not interested so much in EU, perhaps in the money, uh, but they were interested to be in NATO. And they were putting themselves not in the shelter of Brussels, but in the shelter of Washington. And still there, and I see you now a lot of analysis and texts were published uh, in Brussels, Brussels, EU, I mean, not Brussels, Belgium, uh, about more convergence and the dividing of uh, tasks and so on. I think do we really need to go back to deterrence after having made so much effort to denuclearization? You see, we have the feeling to fall back and you cannot hide yourself all the time in the back of Putin. You have sometimes to address the responsibility of the decision taking in the West for supposedly over Western interest. Okay, thank you. Um, well, um, there's still actually there are questions also relating specifically to, to, to the EU uh, and how uh, it should respond um, to the, the recent events in Russia. but. There are two more questions, uh, which are specifically then about um, yeah, Russia's political future. Um, and so the question is as following. So does Navalny really want to run for president? Um, doesn't, wouldn't he prefer to just stay in opposition? Because some experts apparently say that he only wants to lead a revolution that removes the power of the current leaders. Um, maybe Dimitri, maybe Dimitri, maybe you can uh, try to comment on this. Uh, yes, uh, Navalny definitely uh, would like to, to run for, for uh, presidency, but uh, of course he, he cannot do that uh, uh, right now and probably in the near future. Navalny is a kind of a good political animal, uh, and he and uh, he belongs to, to these, uh, I would say like to the, the second post-Soviet uh, generation of uh, civil and political activists. So it's uh, and, uh, like the first generation was a kind of uh, a continuation of uh, rather elite, narrow um, kind of dissident movement, like um, morally driven or uh, ideologically driven. And Navalny, belongs to this, uh, uh, this next uh, generation, uh, which uh, started to, 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 uh, to grow from the um, bottom um, up. And uh, he's a, a representative of rather broad 
uh, like not overwhelmingly broad uh, um, movement uh, in, in the Russian society, but rather broad movement, like a lot of people are, um, is behind him. And uh, uh, also like I, 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 a lot of people would support him uh, in his uh, um, political fight um, um, in the future. So um, definitely uh, he would like to be, uh, he, he's already a, a leading uh, a position or a figure in Russia and uh, would like to be a kind of a candidate, a presidential or a candidate uh, mm -hmm. in, in the future. Well, for the next question, I would like to stay with you because um, so apparently, according to a poll conducted by the Levada Center, and that was released uh, on 11 March, so very recently, the United Russia Party was polling at just 27 percent support. <laughs> could you perhaps draw some predictable consequences, uh, whether this could be this very poor result could be confirmed uh, at the September elections? Uh, because that would probably be the end of Putinism as we know it. Well, the uh, the electoral uh, domination of uh, uh, like United Russia or Putin himself, they uh, do not uh, result from the kind of free uh, uh, you know vote of, of people. So it, it, this is a result of a very massive. Uh, um, a machine of uh, electoral manipulation and fraud. So, and the, the upcoming uh, elections will not be uh, um, like exclusion uh, um, to, uh, to, uh, to these rules. So, uh, the uh, results of this election will depend on uh, the ability of uh, uh, like regime. To, uh, um, to to be um, to continue to, to be eff um, effective in in uh, the, uh, the use of this uh, machine of uh, uh, manipulation and, and fraud. Uh, and uh, again, um, Navalny is important not just like um, a single uh, possible uh, candidate for like presidential, or um, uh, office or, or whatever. He is a, a kind of it's partly uh, like a, a, a technical uh, driver and uh, partly a symbol of uh, these uh, strategy of uh, um, uh, voting, which uh, he called umnegal savanya, smart voting. And it uh, uh, might be well, actually, there is a key point behind this strategy is not to uh, 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 to secure uh, electoral uh, um, victory for uh, Navalny himself or even for those who are, uh, are, are around him. Uh, the key point is to undermine the political monopoly of United Russia and uh, like uh, Putin's uh, political uh, uh, um, uh, machine. Uh, so uh, the the the, the um, key, uh, uh, like the main intrigue uh, of the upcoming elections, is uh, um, uh, would uh, um, uh, uh, evolve around these uh, 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 prospective um, uh, uh, um, strategies of how to to use. Uh, uh, coming from from different uh, segments of uh, Russian political um, uh, arena, how to use this uh, strategy of uh, um, smart uh, uh, voting uh, to uh, benefit, how to benefit uh, from that, and I I, I have a lot of uh, a kind of expectations uh, uh, related to to, to, the, to that, and uh, I do not uh, foresee that like pro-democratic or, or liberal uh, parties like Yabloka or something like that would uh, uh, be um, uh, um, uh, um, like primary beneficiaries of this uh, strategy. I, I would foresee that the communists and uh, nationalists would take 
the um, uh, lion's share of uh, kind of protest uh, uh, votes uh, uh, within this um, uh, framework of uh, smart uh, voting. And that might be, that might uh, bring some change, not like uh, immediate change, but some change to, to the uh, nature of uh, uh, Russian politics. Okay, well, at least uh, I think that is an important insight to share. Uh, and I think it's also going to be our last insight for this evening, because I've seen uh, that we uh, have run out of time. Uh, there were not many questions left, and I believe, actually, we, we had already uh, touched upon them um, previously in the discussion. So, with yeah, dear speakers, dear participants, we have come to the end of our roundtable discussion on Navalny and recent protests in Russia. I really hope that you have enjoyed listening to the discussion. Let me end by thanking our four speakers for their very insightful discussion on all these issues. Um, let me also thank everyone who contributed to organizing the events, because actually uh, behind the scenes, quite a few people uh, were helping to organize the event. And as you see, still <laughs> we managed to have start on a, well, um, less, less positive uh, note with uh, all the technical issues, although we managed to overcome them, thankfully. But I would like to uh, thank in particular uh, the co-director of the Russian platform, Professor Ben Doga, uh, and also our coordinator, Delphine Klutz. Uh, without their help, this event would have not been possible. So uh, special thanks to them. Okay, so um, I wish you all uh, a pleasant rest um, of the evening. Um, I hope that uh, we will reconvene again uh, soon for uh, another discussion. Uh, but uh, for now, um, goodbye everyone, and uh, hopefully see you soon online or physically. All the best. Bye. Goodbye. Goodbye, thank you. Oh, that's nice. <laughs>